Hi divers! Today I'm in Brux, which is uh, often considered as one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. And today I'm here to learn something about accident prevention. Coming up. So I'm walking through this truly beautiful city and uh, for my afternoon's meeting, uh, just a second, they have really, really narrow roads here. Um, and I'm meeting Gareth Locke, who is um, the director of the Human Diver and is uh, one of the leading hats, I would say, in the terms of uh, human factors in diving. And I'm really excited to talk this afternoon with him uh, about human factors in diving. But first, let me show you this really beautiful city. There's a lot of colors, I don't know where to go. See a lot of colors, only feeling blue. There's a lot of colors, lost within a haze. Don't rely on others. To get you through the maze The dreams are not the same for me Standing by the shore While you're on the open sea Cannot take this Voices drowning in the sea. There's too many voices talking back at me. There are a lot of choices waiting to be made. Too many choices making me afraid. I'm, I'm very excited that we uh, today met. Yeah. I, mean, I was really on short notice and was like, hey, come on, let's meet and I'll just oh, let's totally. improvise uh, some quick talk about human factors and just, yeah, let's quickly dive into it. What is what is human factors well, actually? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose the easiest way to describe human factors is the, the things that make it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Um, and, and that might be about designing a training program so that students learn the correct way. It might be about designing a, a rebreather controller when you look at it and you go, I can instantly pick up the information, the critical information I need. Um, or it might be about the decisions you need to make and understand the, those things. So 
uh, a lot of what I do is a subset of human factors. It's called non-technical skills. Um, and, and when I first started teaching this stuff, I, I ran the very first class, the pilot class, and it was called non-technical skills for divers. And the people I had on it was like Phil Short, there was Michael Thomas, Tim Clements, uh, John Kendall, and, and a couple of others. And they went, what do you mean non-technical skills? We've got recreational diving, you've got technical yeah, diving. I think, I think many people are like, what non-technical? We're doing technical diving, yeah, what's, well, what's non-technical? What do you mean? <laughs> so it's like, well, it's decision-making. Ultimately, we want to make the best decisions we can with the information we've got. And that's fed from situation awareness and communications, which is fed from teamwork and leadership and followership. Those are non-technical skills. And then they're all supported by this thing called psychological safety, which is this, this shared belief that I can put my hand up, say something, and I'm not going to feel that, you know, somebody's going to make me feel about this punish, big. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and a just culture, which is when we, we make a mistake and somebody's going to look at it and say, you know what, you're fallible, you're human, let's understand the context. And at the same time, we won't accept sabotage or, or genuinely negligent yeah. behaviors. Now, those are sort of judicial words, but so it, it's about, as I said, trying to make it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong uh, thing. And I think this is this is uh, this is vitally important in diving, and I and 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 it's it's I think it's utterly the the thing many people can maybe recall a situation where somebody is sitting on a boat, like having the bends and not talking about it because feeling ashamed for it or, or yeah. stuff like that. And, and it's, it's, I think it's really important. Oh, it's, it, it, you know, so there's the bit that's happened after the event, and I, I'm dealing with an incident recently where uh, a decompression sickness occurred, and we're, and we're looking into the, the, the reasons why it was difficult to speak up at that time. But it's also before you get in the water where, you know, there's, there's a lot of peer pressure, a lot of social pressure, yeah. that the closer you get to the dive site, the harder it is to say no. Um, that the weather might be picking up, or um, you've got a bit of kit that's that, that's broken, and and you're diving with your buddy, and and you know we say anybody can thumb a dive at any time for any reason, but you may have spent two and a half hours going out to the dive site. You're the only GUE buddy that's you know pair that's on the the, the dive site. Spend might be a hundred bucks or even more to get there. Yeah, exactly. Or even you know, so you sit there going, oh, do I, all right, and then you get in. And now you're committed. Now you're down the rabbit hole, and then it's even harder because, especially if you're on open circuit, you're on trimix, you know, hypoxic trimix, really expensive gas. Now you're in this situation of if I thumb this dive now, I'm going to have to fill that gas up. It, you know, I can't use it again realistically. So there's lots of these things that go through people's minds, and it's not really covered officially or structurally or formally in any of the training programs. No, and that's nowhere, what the human nowhere, diver nowhere. Is, is all yeah. about. So what can I actually do to not go down this rabbit hole? So what, what are the, the, the principal concepts? So the, the first bit so is... How, how do you make me not going down? <laughs> so, so interestingly, I, I can't make you do anything. Um, sure, and, sure. And, and, it, and it's this, this piece where you have to have that, that self-realization. And, and one of the hardest bits is when you're in the game, when you're in it, it is really difficult to recognize that you're in the problem. Sure. So as an individual, but as a team, the likelihood that the team is being sucked into that same hole is, is a little bit more different. So you can start to look at, say, nonverbal cues, and you can ask open questions rather than closed questions. You know, as opposed to Ben, are you okay with this? Because it's an okay dive. That's really hard to to say no against, yeah. but it's like, hey, Ben, the, there's some frowns on your head. What, what's up? You know, uh, I'm a bit concerned about the weather. Is, is there something going on in your mind too? And that's a bit more of an open, inviting question, which requires a little less courage or strength to go, yeah, you know what? There's a bit of my kit that's bust. And, and I don't want to say anything because it means we're going to throw the dive. And it's like, look, don't worry about it. You know, yes, that's the price of the, the exploration we do. And, and the exploration might be just on a small reef, or it could be a massive dive that's got a lot of commitment. Yeah. But it's about creating that psychologically safe environment where I can put my hand up and know that you're going to be okay with it. Um, and I, I expect you to challenge me, and you expect me to challenge you when things aren't quite right. And it's done from a, a constructive purpose rather than, I'm going to make you feel that big.
Yeah, I think that it's really important to like be equally like everyone needs to be big or needs mm. to be on the same level at least. I think it's, that's that's very important. Um, is there a way actually? If I recognize something, is, I'm not comfortable with to communicate that easily underwater because the communication is rather limited underwater. Mm. So uh, is 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 that covered? Yeah. So so interestingly. It, we, we talk about this all like in, in a lot of sort of surface stuff. They, they talk about this speak up culture. Um, and, and what that means is that you've got a leader and you've got a follower. Um, and what we're asking the, the follower to do is speak up and, 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 and raise and try and cross that barrier. Now, there is only a, a certain amount of stepping up that can happen. So what needs to happen is that the leader, the more senior person, the, the sort of strongest peer, makes themselves approachable and vulnerable. And they talk about their own issues that they might have. So if you can create an environment on the surface and you create a sure. curious environment and you ask questions during the brief and you're asking open, curious questions during the brief, you encourage and create the environment where it's okay to ask questions underwater. Um, you know, one, one of the, uh, the, the stories that I've got in the book Under Pressure with Michael Manduno is the... A, 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 an event getting away from him, and it was an inability to challenge the situation underwater, even though he wanted to. Um, so it's about constant communication, even if that's a case of asking what you would think might be really dumb questions, and especially you as an instructor with other divers. You know, people will put you on a pedestal of excellence, and you sit there and go, "Oh my God!" You know, yeah. Ben is like this awesome diver; he's never going to make mistakes. And it's turn around to those those other divers and say, you know what, I'm human. This is this is what happened on the last dive I did, and it might be a little really small thing, but it shows that you're paying attention to your performance, and then you're sharing the fact that you are fallible too. Um, you're not yeah, perfect. Sure, sure. So and 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 that's a, a you know so from your point of view as an instructor, the gradient is up here, and and you know even if you're on a fun dive, you're up here, and and the other divers down here you have to lower yourself down so that the speak up is easier. Because if you stay up here, it, you can't make that gap. Um, and you've got to understand the sorts of pressures that might, people might be under. So, you know, this anybody can thumb a dive at any time and any reason. Mm, okay, it's, it's much yeah. harder to do than... And, than that, that. and that's, yeah, that's easily said, yeah. but hard to do, actually, if you're consider we, we paid money, we all got in the car driving nine hours to get to the spot, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, so even just talking about, you know what, we've just done a nine hour drive to get to this site here. We've invested a whole bunch of stuff. You know what, it's gonna be difficult to thumb a dive if something isn't quite right. So that's one of the first things you can talk about when you get to a site or a location or things like that. Because now you sow the seed with other people. You go, yeah, okay, that's something that we probably need to be aware of. Yeah. It is. Is it? Is it uh, usually harder for for the the lower diver to speak up, or for the higher rank diver to, uh, yeah, be, put themselves out put there? Into, yeah, down. Or... Uh, it, so it, it really does depend on. So I would say in general it is harder for the junior diver to speak up against the, the senior experienced diver because the junior diver has more, potentially more to lose in terms of face and reputation yeah. um, than it is for the instructor. Now, the instructor also has this bit that says, hmm, if I show that I'm not perfect, people might question what I do. And you sit there go, okay, who's made a mistake here? Here's, here's one that I've done. You know, and be able to talk about those and, and talk about them as in real, very recent dives. When, when I speak to instructors on classes and things like that, and I ask them to tell a story, often it's something that's happened two, three, five, ten years ago. They go, no, no, I want something in the last year. Oh, all right, okay. And that increases the level of sure. vulnerability. Sure. Because yeah. now you're talking about something that's that's oh well I you know if it's ten years ago oh yeah I've, I've changed that my youth I, yeah I was like, that's all that I sort of stuff young, yeah. but something that's happened you know within the last year within the last six months or actually in the last course and and this is this piece that says there's always an opportunity to to learn so when I I teach leadership in classes instructors are always leaders in classes 
So you've got two teams, let's say a GUE class, you've got two teams. You've got a student team of, say, three, and then you've got a student plus instructor team of four. So there's two teams running in parallel. At the start of the class, the instructor is definitely leading this class and directing them where to go. But by the end of the class, the student team should be able to be fairly autonomous. But your role as the leader is to support the students and to learn from the students as well. And the instructors, and then students are going to learn from you as well. Yeah, so sure. if you go into this common purpose that says, we're all going to get better, that means that I, I, I can encourage the students to give me critical feedback and improve. But as an instructor that goes into a class that says, my purpose is for you to pass the class and get the certification, there's no incentive for the, the instructor to get better. Because what you said is, I know what I'm doing, and I'm giving you my information. But if you go in there and say, I'm going to improve, then actually the students can give you stuff. And I'm sure that your classes have provided loads of learning for you. Sure, sure. And, and feedback is, is, is uh, first, I think you have to distinguish feedback from criticism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not the same. No, totally. Even if people sometimes mix it up and think it's, it's the same, but yeah. they don't really understand what feedback is. And I think feedback is a gift. And of course, in, in every class, as an instructor, you learn uh, as much as, as the students might learn, maybe in different fields, but mm. you learn oh, yeah. all the time. And this is this is one of the reasons I so one of of my my main motives in life is to learn. Mm -hmm. and this is why I love teaching because I always learn uh, during the classes. Oh, that's, totally. That's, that's, and 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 that's you know at the end of the class and providing that sort of feedback and and development opportunities for the students is to be overt with that and just say you know what this is what I learned from you, and this is what I learned from you, and this is what I learned from you. It's like wow, I thought you knew everything. It's like no. I can never know everything. There's always going to be development opportunities. And it's because you've taught me something, I'm now a better person. Yeah. So what about the, the classes you teach? So how can, uh, so what is the target audience? Mm. Who, who can attend? Um, how, how is that working? How many days is it going? So what, what, what can a diver that never heard about your classes expect? Yeah. Uh, so how so, do people get started with it? So there's this, I'm going to say probably four ways to learn about this. One is that the first two are very passive and, and they are the student's responsibility to own the learning. And that's the book, Under Pressure. So that's about 12, 13 chapters. Um, it'll take about 11 hours if you read it cover to cover of theory mixed with 30 plus stories. So that's about 30 pounds. And, and that is... A, a great way of looking at how theory mixes in with the stories. Um, the next sort of step is an online essentials class, which is uh, $97. Um, it's three and a half hours of content if you watched it end to end, but it's probably about five or six hours if you stop, listen, make notes, and, and, and develop from that side. Um, and, and that's available. And once you sign up, it's, it's yours to keep for, forever. There's no time limit on it. The next step in the process is, is a level one 10 webinar week, a 10 week webinar series. So the next one starts in October, runs through to middle of December. And that 10 week program, nine weeks are of theory covering big building blocks, 90 minute sessions, and you've got some homework to do to consolidate it. So it's like you learn some stuff, and, and most of the students are like head full at the end of the session. You've got some consolidation. I mark all that homework, and then we run through the sessions. And then the final one is, the, is about setting goals for you to do something with this lessons, these lessons. So we go through what you're going to start doing, what you're going to stop doing, what you're going to continue doing in a coaching framework. Um, and then the next sort of step up is a level two course, which is a two-day, normally run at a weekend course, six people on a class, um, very interactive, um, quite intense in terms of the amount you learn and the emotional significance out of this. It's, it's about how to develop a team really quickly using a, a computer-based simulation, which is has been designed, if you took human factors principles in mind and turned them on their head, this is what this computer simulation is about. It is incredibly difficult to operate. You cannot game the system. You can't win on your own. 
you have to work together as a team of four. So six people in a class, four astronauts um, flying this prototype spacecraft, uh, and two observers. And so the four so astronauts- It's a space simulation. It's a space oh, simulation. Yeah. And, and the, the reason it's a space simulation is because nobody can bring any prior knowledge to it. Nobody can go, oh, that simulation is rubbish. That isn't how it's done. And, and they pick holes in the simulation. It's really basic, but it also means that I can use it in diving or in healthcare or software teams or engineering teams. People are the same. Um, it's just sure. the, the, the stories that change. And so you have these four operators and two observers. They run a simulation, run a briefing, simulation, debrief, pick up some learning, and then two of the operators then become the observers, and the two observers become the operators. And then we run those, we run four missions over the two-day period, and it's quite amazing where they look back at the start of day one and go, well, we didn't really know each other, and you know, we didn't know our strengths and weaknesses, and that first mission was just a complete train wreck. And then you get to the end of the second day where it's just going like this. And, and as, as you do when you're an instructor, the better the team gets, the more injects they get sure. to, to try and solve the problem because the learning levels have to go up. Um, and again, at the end of the class, we set learning goals that they will then get emails two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, and 12 weeks after the class to say, you said you were going to start, stop, continue doing this. How are you getting on? And here's ah, a little bit okay, of extra knowledge. Yeah. So it's, I mean, from a, you know, a, a GUE instructor, I think it's a great thing to do is pick up some learning goals at the end of the thing, come up, you know, any of your fundies class or a tech one or whatever, pick some learning goals and then come up with a mailing system like MailChimp or whatever, a CRM, that you can then build those. And what you're doing is you're keeping this theory in front of mind that they can go and practice out on their own dives okay. and, br and keep that keep that learning alive. And that's very smart. That's very smart. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's yeah, effective. No, I, I really, I really like, I really like the idea of like. There's this, there's this tool. I think Mail Not Sure. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know it, where you can write your, yourself, your future self, an email with. with oh, goals. okay, yeah. Uh, 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 that's a really nice tool, and uh, and it's, it's basically this or the same or similar, just in terms of diving. Yeah. And uh, that's a, that's a smart system to remind yourself of what what my goals were. Yeah. And do they match up with what I really did? Yeah, <laughs> well, what I'm doing now. And you know, the, the problem is with, with any learning, when you leave the class, you probably ditch about 50% of the, the information and uh, straight away. And what you've got to do is keep nurturing as, as an instructor, a facilitator. You've got to keep that learning at front of mind so people have this spaced learning that goes, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, or I give them a little problem to solve. And, and I'm always at the end of, the, an email or a WhatsApp or a Facebook message. I mean, I've, I've trained probably 500 people face-to-face -face in wow. six years now. Um, Ooh, about 2,000 people online. The book sold about four and a half, 5,000 copies. I don't know. I've, yeah, I have one uh, copy upstairs, yeah. actually. Uh, that's great. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, and, and actually the, the cheapest, least investment people could make to, to get something out of this in terms of time is to go and visit um, thehumandiver.com forward slash if only. Yeah. I just put which, a link in the description yeah, of the video. Oh yeah, so can yeah. a link to the book and so on so people can easily find it. Totally. Yeah. And that's yeah. just a, a 34 minute video which tells the story of a tragic diving accident through the lens of human factors and just culture. And I was fortunate and privileged to be able to work with the widow and the three remaining members of the dive team to be able to tell the story of what happened that day and how it made sense. And, and that is built into the essentials class where I give a short little, what would be a social media narrative that diver jumped off the back of the boat <clears throat> on a training course, uh, waiting to get into 40 meters of water. They came alongside the boat to get a stage cylinder and they passed out, drowned and, uh, and sank. What do you think happened? And that's the sort of information that we get in social media. Um, yes. Yes. And, and then, get them to capture the information, we run through the class, and then I show them the documentary, and then I say, so what do you think happened now? And it's like, <laughs> loads sure, of information. Sure, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's, um, it's a great documentary to reflect on how easy it is to disappear down that rabbit hole without realizing you're in it, and for a team to be able to sit back and say, 
I'm not quite happy about this. Let's speak up. I was just thinking about asking you to share a story, but this is an excellent story mm. already. And I think, um, yeah, uh, uh, I, it's it's really valuable to to look for yeah, yeah look for for the course and 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 see yeah what is what is behind that story, which can be told in very short sentences, but in a, in, in reality is is really long. I think. And, oh, totally. And 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 one of the the biggest challenges is that social media leads us to very short stories. And people have very short attention spans. Um, and they just want to hear the, the sort of the, the proximal causes, the causes that happen right next to it. The, in, in this case here, the, the diver jumped off the back of the boat with her oxygen cylinder switched off. Uh, and you go, oh, duh, stupid. Now, Brian wasn't stupid. You know, what he did that may, day made absolute sense to him. And we have this concept called uh, local rationality or bounded rationality. How did it make sense for him to do what he did? And it's the backstory, the second story that we have to dig into. And that means asking more curious yeah. questions, not why did you do it that way? Because if I ask why, I've already got a reason why I what the correct sure. answer is. And Most I'm asking people, you to uh, yeah, I'm sure, asking you sure. justify sure, sure. why your, your poor decisions. But actually, if I say, how did it make sense? Now I'm asking you to dig into your head to yeah, look at sure. that decision making. That's process. very important because most people are not just evil or just stupid no. or just they 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 have a, a yeah they have a rationality or, or yeah they there's a reason behind their actions and it's it's very important to understand the reason behind the actions. And, yeah, oh totally. It's very very hard. I think sometimes for people even driving a car in the traffic, it's like. This guy's driving <laughs> like like stupid. This yeah. one is stupid. Everyone is stupid, except me. But that's oh, not yeah. true because everyone has his uh, his or her reason to do what what oh, they totally. actually the did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. Perfect. So it's digging into that. And and if there would be one thing that I would ask people to take away is ask that question: How did it make sense for that person to do what they did at that time? Forget what you know. What the outcome is, because you're biased. You've got the outcome. You can join the dots back and you go, oh, rubbish decision, rubbish decision, rubbish decision. And here's the, the root cause, which never exists, by the yeah, way. Sure. <laughs> the, 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 the rubbish root cause decision. If they hadn't done that, then this wouldn't have happened. And you go, okay, let's put yourself here. Do you know what the outcome of all of those different decision steps might be? That maybe four or five, six steps, and each one of those has got, say, four. So I go four, four, four. Four. So I'm now up to 64 or 100 and whatever, four times. 256. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, so right. <laughs> I have 256 different outcomes with only four steps in five steps in place. Yeah, sure. I have no idea. But if I know what the outcome is, I can go ding, it's ding, ding, easy ding, ding, ding. Follow up there to we the go. point. Yes, yes. So let's look at that decision making process without understanding of the outcome. Yeah. I like that question. I think we should more often ask the question, how did that make sense to that particular person? Yeah. 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 Actually, that's, I think this is, this is a great uh, take-home message from yeah. this video. And uh, yeah, I think you, you have to leave anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, Thank brilliant. you very much for no, this thank really you. quick in interview. Brilliant. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, I hope to meet you very soon. Brilliant. Take care. Thanks very much. Thank you. There's a lot of colors I don't know where to go See a lot of colors Only feeling blue So, well, yeah. It was a really good opportunity to talk to uh, Gareth about human factors and I think it's quite an important thing uh, for all divers and uh, I think the courses he offers are are uh, really, really awesome uh, and, and really special. So yeah, I keep exploring the city a little bit more. And uh, I put the links to Gareth's book and uh, to Gareth's book and uh, to his courses and his website in the description below. Well, yeah, and, and I'm planning to do more content about human factors. Or maybe I, I do a little bit more with Garrett together. So if you would like to know more about the topic, uh, consider subscribing to my channel and ring the bell. 
and never miss upcoming videos like these.